Thank you, Speaker Packard. And I want to also send greetings to Lou Alessandro, um, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to the New Hampshire State Senate. Um, my family has a long history and deep history in this state, going back to my great-grandparents, Honey Fitz and, um, and Patrick Kennedy. My grandfather, Joseph Kennedy, spent his summer camps at Lake Wine Oak um, up in Wolfsboro. I grew up camping and hiking every summer and every winter in New Hampshire, hiking the presidential range. I talked with uh, Speaker Packard and saw his beautiful uh, photographs of some of those peaks. I told him that I'd spent many nights on Mount Washington in the huts in the middle of the winter skiing Tuckerman's Ravine. Uh, I hiked in the summer times the presidentials, but also Osceola, a, a tri-pyramid. Uh, Mount Carrigan, Mount Flume, and many, many others. Um, my brothers cut trails for their summer job at uh, Waterville Valley. And, uh, and I'm very proud that Tommy Corcoran named the steepest slope at Waterville after my father, who loved to ski there as well. Um, I'm here because uh, I am going to participate in this primary in this state. I oppose the DNC's decision to evict New Hampshire from the first in nation status, which is so important, I think, to our country. Uh, it is more than a tradition. New Hampshire plays a critical role in vetting candidates for the rest of the country. In <laughs> Other parts of the United States, the states are content with having politicians come in with money that they've gotten from billionaires and carpet bombing the state from 30,000 feet with advertising or staging occasionally rallies that are heavily orchestrated uh, where the crowds are heavily screened and they're kind of a kabuki theater of democracy. But here, politicians get real democracy. They encounter people. They have to go to the hair salons, the barber shops, the diners, the gas stations. They have to talk to the 80-year-old lady who reads the Financial Times and The Economist every week and ask them a question and a follow-up question and another follow-up question that they will never get from CNN. They will never get it from The New York Times even. And it's retail politics. And they are vetting our candidates the same way that they would vet a city council candidate or a local mayor. And they do it for the rest of the country. And the other thing that's very important about New Hampshire is that there are 42% of the people in this state are registered independents. It's the highest of any state. And the importance of that right now is that those are people who are critical thinkers, they're independent thinkers, and they're able to step outside of that fixed, paralyzing iceberg of partisanship that has our country at each other's throats. They're able to look at candidates without the ideology blocking their vision and really judge the candidates on what they say and be open to new ideas that are not locked in that, that ideological uh, 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 razor grip. Um, Right now, it's particularly important at New Hampshire that we, that we have a real democracy and a democratic election in New Hampshire. There's so many Americans who believe that the system now is rigged, the economic system, but also the political system, that the elections are fixed. New Hampshire has the gold standard for political elections. People don't question the results. And we ought to be, the Democratic Party particularly, ought to be making this election a template for, uh, for democracy to our country and to the rest of the world. And say, we're going to have a real democracy where candidates meet human beings, are questioned by them, have town halls, and deal with all of the difficulties of retail politics. And, uh, and we need to show the American people that is particularly important at this time. Um, for another reason, and the, I believe that the motto of the Granite State, live free and die, is not just a motto. The many people in New Hampshire take that personally. They have a fierce pride in liberty. 
Over 500 New Hampshire men died in the American Revolution to give us our freedoms, to give us our rights, along with 25,000 elsewhere in our country. And today, those rights are under attack like never before in our history. In the last three years, there's been an all-out assault on the Bill of Rights. We now have, for the first time, the government participating in censorship of political dissent, of people who are criticizing federal policies. We saw churches closed. We saw freedom of worship threatened. Every church in this country was closed for a year without any scientific citation, without any uh, uh, democratic process, no notice and comment, public hearings. All of that was just abolished. And a, a bureaucrat just decided to close all the churches. And they went after freedom of assembly. They shut down. They said, we have to social distance. We have to lock ourselves in our house. They went after the Fifth Amendment uh, uh, rights to property rights. They closed down 3.3 million businesses in this country with no due process, no just compensation. They went after the Fourth Amendment guarantees against warrantless searches and seizures with all this intrusive um, government uh, track and trace surveillance and Americans had to show their medical records before leaving their homes or entering a public building. And they abolished jury trials for whole, whole classes of defendants. So they, for the people in the pharmaceutical industry or the medical cartel, uh, no matter how grievous your injury, no matter how negligent their conduct or reckless, you could, Americans could not sue them for the redress. The Seventh Amendment is very simple, it says, no American shall be deprived of the right of a jury before a trial of their peers in cases or controversies exceeding $25. There is no pandemic exception. And the framers knew all about pandemics and epidemics. There was an epidemic, two epidemics during the Revolutionary War, a malaria epidemic that decimated the armies of Virginia, a smallpox epidemic that affected New Hampshire at the very time when Benedict Arnold's armies conquered Montreal and they had to withdraw from Montreal because their troop strength was so low because of smallpox. Otherwise, today, Canada would be part of the United States. The framers knew that. They also, between the end of the revolution and the ratification of the Bill of Rights, there were epidemics in every city in this country, smallpox epidemics, cholera epidemics, um, yellow fever epidemics that killed tens of thousands of people, including many of the family members of the framers. And yet they did not put an epidemic exception in the United States Constitution. They wrote that document for hard times, not for easy times. During the Civil War, when the Confederate, were sent, Confederate government was sending agents provocateur to every American city, northern city, to drum up draft riots. Abraham Lincoln tried to arrest the Confederates when they came in. They knew who they were. And he suspended habeas corpus. And the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Taney, said you can't do it. Even, even if the life of the nation is at stake, you cannot do it. Even we, in the Civil War, there were 659,000 people who died is the equivalent of 7.7 7, 7, million 200,000 today, much worse than the pandemic. And yet the Supreme Court said you cannot suspend the Constitution no matter what. It's more important than anything. And today, now, we have all these new surveillance technologies. We have digital currencies, AI technology, which is frightening, uh, GPS technologies, 400,000 low-level satellites that are going to look at every square inch of the Earth every day. It has been the ambition of every totalitarian regime in history to control every aspect of human behavior. They've never been able to do it, but they can do it now. And it's so important that we counter that threat by strengthening and fortifying our democratic institutions, not weakening them. And that begins with the Bill of Rights, and it includes the New Hampshire primary. And I want to tell you, I'm going to be in this state fighting to win every vote I can in New Hampshire, Republican, Democratic, and Independent. And I, when I'm elected president, 
and I'm ahead of the Democratic Party, I'm going to pour concrete on the notion that New Hampshire is first in the nation. Thank you very much. So our tradition has been, uh, Mr. Kennedy, that all of the candidates that come here get to sign uh, this license plate. And as a fellow outdoor enthusiast, I think you need to sign somewhere near the old man of the mountain. <laughs> thank you, Speaker Packard, and thank you all. Now, wait, one more thing. One more thing. <laughs> it sounds like, from our conversation, that you've been to many of these places, too. So for the, all of the other presidential candidates, I've said, here's a Jeb Bradley calendar. <laughs> this is your homework assignment, but I think you've probably done a lot of that homework. Yes, I have. So, um, Mr. Kennedy actually has um, kayaked the or rafted the Middle Falls of the Salmon, kayaked. which uh, my kids are actual guides and they've done that too. And some of the pictures I've seen are hellacious. So, we've enjoyed many of the beautiful spots in America. Um, one of the pictures in here, Landscape Arch, the June picture, you've been to, I've been to in uh, Moab. So thank you very much for being in thank New Hampshire. And please enjoy our state and its hospitality. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you all. <laughs> they want a picture. They want a picture.